This video is sponsored by JLC PCB, who have seriously leveled up since my last sponsored video. Global path sourcing, 3D printing, 4 and 6 layer boards for $2. All the more reason to use their services. Link in the description. This is the marvelous little Raspberry Pi Pico, which made an appearance last time, but somehow I was not able to squeeze it in. This was a purchase I made on a whim but then shelved because I didn't know how to use it. I've brought it out again because of one glaring problem with the Arduino Nano. It's lack of hardware SPI lines. I'm limited to just one and to use my integrated ADC to measure residue, I need another since it talks SPI. That is where this beast of a microcontroller comes in. Apparently, it's recognized as a flash drive if you plug it in with the reset button pressed and it's easy to drag and drop a UF2 file which it recognizes instantly and reboots. None of the pins are 5V compatible which is what my multi-slope logic section uses and I've learned my lesson from last time about logic levels. The solution to that is a level shifter. I think I know where to find them. NANI? Ah, there they are. This collection consists of an LSO7 open collector buffer, another LSO7 open collector buffer, a HC14 hex inverter, an LS125A gated buffer, and an LVC07. Two of these, combined with some pull up resistors, might be of use. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess Marco did it better. But anyway, with a little code from our old friend Dimin and the level shifter, I was able to make the Pico work. The fact that the last few digits repeat in a pattern is not a coincidence, it is some kind of weird mathematical computer science problem, both of which go right over my head. At least it's not my problem, mostly. The code Dimin wrote for me is underrated and I will explain it this time. Bruh. Hey, I was in the middle of an explanation. Dimin had the bright idea to use the SPI interface to read the pulses from the multi-slope on the falling edge. This way I get a count of the number of clock cycles for which the negative reference was turned on. And with some maths, the time the positive reference was on and overall the voltage. Now with that sorted out, there is one more step to take before I add the residue ADC. The output voltage of the integrator is anywhere between plus and minus 12 volts and that has to be scaled to 0 to 5 volts which is taken care of by the simple resistor network. And as you can see, the scaling works, but there is a slight negative excursion which the internal protection diodes of the ADC should take care of, which they do. Dimin and I tried hard for a week to get the residue ADC to measure reliably, but thanks to the weird SPI implementation, we got nowhere. In the end, we decided to try using the Pico's integrated ADC, which worked, but apparently this ADC has problems of its own, as shown by this excellent series of articles by Mark Omo, link in the description. I decided to ignore the problems for now and go ahead and do some residue measurement, but since the original ADC was designed for 5V operation, I have to change the values of the scaling resistors. Once I find the right resistor values in this heap. Everyone likes cheap things, and even more so if those things are high quality. And the Raspberry Pi Pico fulfills both, which is why I decided to get two more. They came at the right time. I was in the middle of PCB design and I wanted to verify complementary PWM and I didn't want to disturb the multi-slope that was already on the bench. So Dimin sent me more code which I tested on the new Picos and of course they worked, since apparently all Pico boards are factory tested. Surprising considering how cheap the thing is. And when I found out that the Pico has a built-in temperature sensor, I was ecstatic. But apparently the resolution is terrible, only 3 or 4 divisions per celsius. So I have to be content with the fact that my AC temperature is somewhere between 20.58 and 21.05 celsius. Oops, I got sidetracked. Back to the multi-slope. But wait, where's the Pico? There it is, testing a failed temperature logger. We've seen this too many times, so here's a shot of the DHL truck instead, which I was able to capture thanks to some fortunate timing. I'm running out of unboxing spots, so this poorly lit angle will have to do. I should point out that the box is much smaller than last time, but that could be because I ordered only two boards this time. The first of which is a set of triple five sequencer boards for the railgun. 
The second set are the topic of today's video, a bunch of brand new multi-slope boards, this time with better and not fake paths. Getting this is totally justified by the mess it's replacing. I'll take a break from this amazing batch of pomegranate to show you exactly what is on this board. The reference and the integrator op amps are OPA2197s and the input buffer is an OPA197. These were selected rather carefully. Although they were not my first choice, I ended up using them because I forgot to take into account the slew rate. I would have ordered these boards if not for the sharp eyes of Tarkovsky from the rep server. Not mentioning his help and advice for this project would be an act of criminal negligence. The input multiplexer is an AD part. There were cheaper ones available, but why not? The comparator again is an LM311 because I couldn't find LT1011s. The D flip flop is now a 74HC74 and the analog switches are LV4053As since they all run off 3 volts now, eliminating the need for logic level translation. The first power up always makes me nervous, but luckily this time everything seemed fine. This is a reference that very few people will get. Turn it around. <laughs> look at it, look at it. OMG, man. But this reference on the other hand is a common LM399 which I decided to use this time. Tarkovsky asked me to hold the leads with tweezers while soldering. Which I did, for one pin. I spent more time making sure the thing was aligned rather than making sure I did a good job soldering. And to add insult to injury, I tried cleaning up my solder joints after the fact. I decided to preserve the leads of course since this is no ordinary part, so I'm assuming the leads have some magic to them as well. The first time I turned this thing on with the reference solder, I was in for a nasty shock since the Zeno voltage was 9 volts, way beyond the 695 volt nominal. It took me a while to realize that I'd been screwed by my own convoluted grounding scheme. I had to short a jumper to connect analog ground to signal ground which finally provided a return path for the Zener, which now showed a voltage of 6.86 volts which was within spec. That makes the negative reference minus 9.91 volts and the positive reference 9.96 volts. At this point I was ready to solder on the Pi Pico. I didn't have the LT5400 one resistor network, so in my attempt to make an LT5400 substitute, I ended up damaging one of the pads. I decided not to go any further since more damage meant moving to another board and I didn't want to desolder the Pico and its castellated pads. Many months later. Now for the hard part, soldering the tiny MSOP package by hand, a task made even more difficult by the fact that I have to do this thing from behind the camera. Oh, that reminds me of the thermal pad on the underside, which I can't really solder using an iron. That's it, I'm doing this off camera. I managed to mess this up even off camera. Quick, let's clean this up before Tarkovsky and the other volt nuts come banging on my door with pitchforks. I think I have a roll of desoldering wick in there, somewhere. Aha, there it is. It worked surprisingly well. Cleaning up the flux, I can already hear footsteps and metallic noises outside my door. Now that's more like it. After what seemed like forever, I finally got the thing running. After figuring out that the Pico does not like to talk USB when powered externally with 5 volts and correcting a mistake in the PCB. The same mistake I made last time. A little interesting thing to note. The LM399 makes my power supply go into CC mode till the heater reaches the set temperature. The code in here switches the input multiplexer between the input, reference voltage, minus 10 volt reference, plus 10 volt reference and ground. And it is interesting to see how the integrator responds to different input voltages. To visualize that better, here is the multi-slope waveform with a 0.01Hz sawtooth wave on the input. You will see how the patterns change as the input voltage changes. One thing you notice when you look carefully at these waveforms is an unsightly spike at the peak of each cycle. This is the dreaded charge injection caused by switch capacitance injecting charge into the integrator at every transition. Since this is an integrating ADC, the small changes can accumulate and cause non-linearities. The only way to combat this is to have a constant number of switch transitions, but in my free-running architecture, there is no guarantee that a certain input voltage will produce the same pattern as shown in this classic HP journal figure, and in real life. For this reason, we need a crazy circuit like this to implement a constant switch transitions algorithm. 
a PWM generator clocked at 100 kHz with a selectable 20% or 80% duty cycle and complementary outputs, a comparator and D flip flop to select the duty cycle, and the classic integrator. The PWM generator starts off with 20% duty cycle, reads the comparator input at the beginning of each clock cycle, and sets the duty cycle to 80% if the integrator is above zero, and keeps it at 20% if it is below zero. This way, there is always a zero crossing in every cycle. And since the number of switch transitions is constant per cycle, the charge injection adds up linearly and can be calibrated out. Luckily, most of this can be implemented in a microcontroller and with some magic code from Dimin, I can feast my eyes on an elegant algorithm in action. The only change made to the original design was doubling the clock frequency to keep the integrator from saturating and maintaining a 5V headroom above and below the supply rails of the op amp, keeping out of the dreaded non-linear zone. Of course, this was not achieved easily. It took two tries to get the multi-slope multi-sloping and even when it seemed to work, there were two things wrong with the waveform. The first is the presence of random peaks where the PWM output makes no sense and second... A flat zone where both switches turn off which is not supposed to happen. With a positive input voltage, the negative reference has to turn on more often to keep the integrator charge balanced and the other way around with a negative input. You can see the blue and purple traces switching to 80% duty cycle in a complementary fashion, keeping the average charge on the integrating capacitor near zero. While waiting for code, I took a detour and made this thing, which is yet another breadboard multi-slope. This time, to try and keep integrator saturation in check, I made a bounded integrator topology where the integrator waveform bounces between two limits. As you can see, the waveform's amplitude remains constant regardless of the input voltage. Getting counts is not a problem since the switch transitions are synced with the clock. If you still don't believe me, here is a more variable part of the waveform. You can clearly see that the switch turns on in sync with the clock. The biggest advantage that I could see in this method is that there are very few switch transitions relative to clock pulses, so charge injection is kept under control. However, this method is not without its problems. For one, the integrator frequency varies with the input voltage. This might not seem like much of a problem, but it skews the count ratio and therefore to get the same resolution, different input voltages need different integration times. The second is that longer slopes are more prone to long-term effects like dielectric absorption and low frequency noise. And of course, if you go the SPI way, weird things happen to the clock pulses at high frequencies. One good thing that came out of this experiment was that I realized how important comparator hysteresis is. Waveforms that look something like this end up much cleaner with a little hysteresis. In the end, the PWM method is the right balance of fast slopes and constant switch transitions. This method turned out to be much older than I expected and seems to have originated with the LD120 chipset as far as I can tell. This datasheet which I have linked down below is a treasure trove of information. I found this figure relating the overall trend of fast slopes to input voltage particularly enlightening. This was something that was clearly evident in the free running topology but I never noticed it. Digging deeper, I found this paper which I will also link below. Here, the maths behind the PWM topology is explained quite well, including a method to get more counts per PWM cycle and a very interesting dual slope rundown to read residue. It's time to switch gears. This 3D printed enclosure is going to become the final case for the ADC. This spotted module the mains to DC converter, and these mini isolated converters perform the final translation to plus and minus 12 volt and 5 volt rails. 朋友是一个坚韧不拔的纪录片，在香港这座城市。I was eventually able to translate it, and the TLDR is that it passed. A nice, seemingly gold-plated set of input terminals, and of course, a few connectors. Powering this from the main saves a lot of effort, but given my poor wiring, there is always a chance that this thing could blow up. But that didn't happen. And with everything integrated, it powers on and measures fine. It took Dimin and I ages to get the timings right, but we finally did it using PIO a peripheral state machine, eight of which are embedded into the RP2040. It was perfect for the multi-slope and with some clever assembly it can take care of multi-sloping on the side while the two main cores do the number crunching. What worried me a little was that the integrator was not responding to input voltage. That turned out to be a small software bug but this reveals something interesting. Despite no charge being added to the integrator through the inputs and the references cancelling each other out, the integrator charge increased linearly with every multi-sloping cycle. 
it could just be charge injection from the reference switches, in which case it is a relief to see it adds up linearly and can be calibrated out. Along the way, we got power line cycles figured out too. The readings happen in exactly 20 milliseconds, so power line interference from the positive and negative half main cycles cancels out. Of course, the fundamental multi slope action still takes place. Now, for a quick test inspired once again by Mark Homo. Connect the multi slope up to a 20 volt peak to peak slow sine wave and collect the readings for a long time. In my case, 2 hours, put it into Excel and make a histogram. After a little manipulation, we are left with this graph, which is called a sine histogram, a crude way of measuring linearity. First off, the shape is acceptable and there are no large spikes which indicate poor DNL. The small spike in the middle could just be my function generator's crossover distortion. Now let's try some actual readings. We begin by setting my function generator to 10 volts DC, calibrating that using my U1232A, noting down the multi-slope raw counts, converting the raw counts to a count difference between the number of negative and positive switch cycles which gives us our negative full scale counts. Repeating the same steps but with minus 10 volts, we get the negative full scale counts. Now let's set the function generator to some random voltage and note that down from the 1232A. Once more, we note down the counts from the ADC and calculate the count difference. This count difference is proportional to the input voltage. I mess the signs up, but by dividing the measurement counts by the full scale counts and multiplying by the reference voltage, we get almost exactly the correct input voltage, which is a big win. That sucks, man! What really sucks is the fact that the ADC is noisy. And I'm pretty sure it's because of the changing integrator levels after one PLC of measurement, which is probably because of charge injection, leakage and dielectric absorption. This can be fixed using rundown and auto zero, but that paper from before showed a simple solution that needs no extra hardware. Dithering or disconnecting the input and letting the reference which is free run, keeping the integrator around the comparator threshold. This is easily implemented in PIO, although for some reason the amplitude of the integrator is higher than I expected and increasing the clock frequency does not help. It turned out to be a comparator issue which will be covered in a future video. Wait, haven't we been here before? Except that this time, Dimin got bombed out of his country and I was left on my own. After weeks of suffering, I discovered MicroPython for the Pico, which also features PIO. Although our friendly snake has a reputation for being slow, PIO works perfectly fine. Even for an electronics caveman like me, coding in Python is super easy. And after a few modifications to the code, I have dithering working. I must note at this point that if the main clock frequency is not an exact multiple of PIO clock, weird things happen. I ran into a couple of roadblocks that finally forced me to tackle the C, C++ SDK. Two hours and three people later, it was working. And I was able to get PWM and dithering running. For some reason, I was not able to write to the scratch registers when I wanted to and I had to bring Dimin back to try a new idea. Desaturation, which reads the comparator and drives the integrator in the other direction to reach zero, and then starting PWM. And just like that, we have the most beautiful noise free readings. The last piece of the puzzle is rundown. Inject dummy charge worth 32 clocks to make sure that the integrator is negative, and then ramp up while measuring how many clocks it took to get to zero. The difference between the latter and former should be the residual charge in the integrator neatly summed up in terms of clocks, which can be added almost directly to PWM counts. Of course, the results were super noisy. It took me long enough to figure out that it might be because of all the wires hanging out of the thing. Since I didn't really need to probe signals anymore, I decided to clean up. That was kind of inevitable, wasn't it? The only other thing we can do is watch the ADC do its thing. Logging and analyzing the results showed that not only is the thing noisy, but it can't seem to decide on what digital code to output for the same input voltage. This trend got worse over more integration cycles with the readings diverging into four groups. I ran some more tests over various PLCs and noticed that the divergence happens at around 5 PLC. Measuring input and zeroing in rapid succession as Kleinstein from the EEV blog forum suggested, link in the description, for one power line cycle and then averaging 10 such readings showed some improvement, but the histogram seems to be overly right leaning. Doing the same thing over 15 PLCs and then averaging that 10 times shows no reduction in noise. Verdict? Software bug. Now, I could go on and on about this. Software bugs are not really easy to fix and I have already spent 5 nights staying up till 2am trying to fix this. 
This video is already 20 minutes long and there is still a lot to cover. For now, all I can say is that Multislope 3 is already on the way. Once again, thanks to JLCPCB for sponsoring this video and helping this project get so far. A link to their website is in the description below.